So here we are at the end of the play Macbeth with act number five in taking our notes. As we start out in act five, scene one, we find out that Lady Macbeth has been sleepwalking and while she sleepwalks, she starts blurting out everything that she and Macbeth have done. You remember she laughed at her husband earlier on when he had just killed King Duncan. He had blood on his hands and he was kind of freaking out a little bit there. And she made fun of him for doing that. Well, it just took her longer to feel it. But once she did, now she's lost all sense of reality. A doctor and Lady Macbeth's gentlewoman or personal nurse have been there. The doctor's watched two nights and hasn't seen anything. But this night, Lady Macbeth starts sleepwalking again and talking in her sleepwalking. Lady Macbeth has a candle with her. And the doctor says, see, her eyes are open. But the gentlewoman says, yes, but their sense is shut. And then the doctor, what is it she does now? Look how she rubs her hands. And the gentlewoman says, yes, she washes her hands sometimes for 15 minutes at a time. And, of course, she is enacting that same image of Macbeth wringing his hands, trying to get the blood off. So Lady Macbeth keeps going out, damn spot, out, I say. She tries to rub the spots of blood off her hands, and she cannot. Of course, there's no blood there anymore, but she thinks that there's still blood there. Who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? So they know that's King Duncan. The doctor says, did you hear that? The Thane of Fife had a wife. Where is she now? Would these hands never be clean? That's in reference to Lady Macduff, who was assassinated by Macbeth. So the doctor tells the gentlewoman to leave because she's heard some things she shouldn't hear. But, of course, the gentlewoman's heard it all already. The doctor says, I don't know what to do about this. This disease is beyond my practice. I tell you again, Lady Macbeth says, Banquo's buried. He can't come out of his grave. And the doctor says, that too, even so? To bed, to bed. There's knocking at the gate. Give me your hand. To bed, to bed. And the doctor says, God, forgive us all. More needs she the divine than the physician. So he doesn't know what to do for Lady Macbeth. He says, she needs God's help. She doesn't need mine. Scene two. The country near Dunsinane, many of the, Eng the Scottish rather noblemen, Mentieth, Angus, Caithness, Lennox, are all there. Now, it's not just those men. It's all of their army. All the men and boys who live in their county make up their army. So every time we see one of these people now, in a military sense, it's that person plus maybe five to 10, 15,000 on their side. So they are the generals now leading their own armies against Macbeth. Angus says, near Burnham Wood, shall we meet them? Now, who are they meeting? They're meeting the English army led by Malcolm, the 10,000. He was loaned by the English king to help him out. So those 10,000 are going to rendezvous at Burnham Wood Forest with the Scottish noblemen as well. So tens of thousands of people are descending on Macbeth's castle to get rid of Macbeth. You remember what we heard about Burnham Wood? One of the apparitions said Macbeth could only be defeated when Burnhamwood Forest got up and moved to Dunsinane Hill where his castle is. Keep that in mind. Scene three. Macbeth says, bring me no more reports. Let them fly all. But then he asks for more reports. He asks for his armor to be put on. But then he says, I don't want my armor. But then he asks for it again. So he's so distraught, he doesn't know what he wants. Some poor soldier comes in or a servant comes in uh, to report that the English force is advancing. The doctor comes in, says that Lady Macbeth needs to help herself. He can't do anything for her. And Macbeth says, throw medicine to the dogs. I'll have none of it. But then he asks for a medical opinion about what it is that's hurting his land. Well, of course, he is the one hurting his land. And the doctor says, I should, I should have gotten out of here while I have the chance. We're offering Dunson ain't away and clear. Prophet again should hardly draw me here, but it's too late. Everything's surrounded by this point. Scene four, the country near Burnham Wood. So in scene four, we're in the country near Burnham Wood. 
the English force has met up with the Scottish force. They're going to join together to go against Macbeth. And Malcolm has an idea. Malcolm says, let every soldier hew him down a bow and bear it before him. Thereby shall we shadow the numbers of our host and make discovery err in report of us. Now, what are they doing? The soldiers are going to tear down branches from Burnham Wood Forest, hold the branches in front of them as camouflage. Now, Macbeth already knows 10,000 English are advancing, but he doesn't know how many Scottish people are going to join them. So to hide their combined numbers, they're all going to hold tree branches in front of them as camouflage and make their way up the hill as they storm the castle. So literally, what's happening? Wood from Burnham, Burnham Wood, is coming to Dunsinane Hill. The prophecy is coming true. You notice the prophecy, that was the last of the prophecies, but the first that's going to happen. Scene five. Macbeth knows he's getting surrounded, and he hears women screaming. The servant Seton goes to find out what's wrong, and he has to report. The queen, my lord, is dead. And then we have the most famous of the short soliloquies, maybe in all of Shakespeare. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. All the past, Macbeth says, has amounted to absolutely nothing. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. To him, life is a little candle. It burns for a little while and then it goes out. It's an actor that acts on stage for a little while that makes his exit. It's a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. So that shows what a life that is led very poorly, the conclusion that that life comes to, that life has no meaning whatsoever. And so for Macbeth, it's all over with. Now, he's a general. Shakespeare at least lets him keep that bravery all the way through the play. That doesn't change. He wouldn't be a one-time hero if that were the case. But he knows it's over at this point. A messenger says, Sir, I looked toward Burnham Wood and I thought the woods were moving. Liar and slave. No, sir, let me endure your wrath if it be not so. I say, you may see it coming. A moving grove. So it looked like the whole woods were moving. You think about 10,000 people with branches they're carrying on the move through the forest up to the castle. It would look as if the forest is moving. Now, Macbeth is an old general. He's probably employed that same tactic himself in previous battles. And so it finally dawns on him what that meant, that prophecy. So he tells the young man, if you're lying, I'll hang you from the nearest tree. But if you're telling the truth, you might as well hang me up. He knows it's over. But he's going to go out fighting. Scene six, Malcolm orders everybody to throw their camouflage down and start storming the castle. Scene seven, Macbeth says, they tied me to a stake. Bear-like, I must fight the courts. They used to have bear baiting rings in Shakespeare's day where they tied a bear to a stake in the middle of an arena and let wild dogs loose on the bear. People would bet which would survive the longest, the bear or the dogs. And so that uh, awful blood sport that they had, Macbeth says, that's me. I'm the bear. I've been tied to a stake and they're the wild dogs and they're coming after me. But then he notices a young soldier found him first. This is the son of the English commander. The old commander of the English force helping Malcolm is Seward. This is his son, young Seward. We'd say Seward Jr. And unfortunately for the young man, although he tries to be brave, Macbeth is a better warrior and quickly kills the young man, and laughs at him and says, well, you were born of a woman. I laugh at weapons brandished by somebody born of a woman because he's still trying to put his faith in that last prophecy. He can only be defeated by somebody not born from a woman. Old Seward tells Malcolm that it's time to storm the castle. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of the people who were fighting for Macbeth have switched sides now. Scene eight, Macbeth will not kill himself as is a custom rather than let the enemy take you. He says, I'm not going to do that. And then Macduff finds him. Turn, hellhound, turn. And Macbeth seems almost regretful. He says, just get back. I've hurt you too much already. Well, Macduff doesn't want to hear any of that. He says, you will fight me. And Macbeth says, no, I won't. He says, I, I, can't, I can't fight you. I yield a charmed life 
one which must not yield to one of woman born. And Macduff says, well, guess what? I was from my mother's womb untimely ripped. In other words, his mother had died giving birth to him, but they'd been able to save the baby. A cesarean was not an optional procedure back then. And so he wasn't born in the regular way. He was born by surgical procedure. He wasn't born to a living woman. And so that's what Macbeth now knows the witches meant. Maybe he remembers Banquo's words, whereby Banquo warned him, the witches will tell you half-truths and then trap you. And so he says, okay, I'm not going to fight you. And Macduff says, okay, then we'll put you in a cage and we'll all make fun of you. Lead you around the countryside. Let people make fun of you. Throw things at you. Well, Macbeth says, no, he's got too much pride for that. He says, we will go out fighting. Then we shift to Malcolm talking to his uncle Seward. And Malcolm says, you know, a lot of the people we, we uh, brought with us are missing. I don't know where Macduff is, and I don't know where your son is. Ross shows up and tells the old Anglo-Saxon general that his boy has been killed. And the old man wants to know if the boy had the wounds on the front. Did he die honorably fighting, or was he running away? And Ross says, no, sir, he died with his wounds on the front. And so the old general, Seward, says, well, then he's God's soldier, and that's the best compliment that he could ever have. Macduff enters, and he is holding Macbeth's head and proclaims young Malcolm the new king of Scotland. And Malcolm has the wrap-up speech. A lot of times in Shakespeare, the one giving the last speech is the one sent to restore order to all the chaos that has happened. And Malcolm tells them he will name them a new title, Earl. He will all pay them back for anything that they spent in helping him out. He mentions that Lady Macbeth took off her own life and he calls them the dead butcher and the fiend-like queen. And so he says, we're all going to go to Scone. I'm going to be crowned your new king. And he thanks everybody for helping him out. And so Malcolm is named the new king. He is the one who's going to restore the order to the weary country, war-weary country. So thanks to all at once and to each one whom we invite to see us crowned at Scone. And so Shakespeare has restored order to the chaos that had erupted. Everything is put back in its place and everything's going to be fine. 